Welcome back to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path. I'm your host, Mike Allen. Marian Anderson happened to be a black female opera singer, one of the very best opera singers to set foot on a stage anywhere in the world, anytime. And you know, if that's all you ever remember about her, she would actually be proud because that's what she set out to do in her life. But along the way, she faced some of the worst years in the U.S., the years of Jim Crow segregation. That's when segregation was legal. What she did was she used a quiet, dignified manner that she had to persevere throughout the face of the horrible, ugly civil rights movement. In fact, her name is even mentioned in the same breath with Martin Luther King Jr. But that was not what she sought, that's what she ended up doing. Well, here to talk about Marian Anderson's extraordinary life and her 50 years as a resident of Danbury, Connecticut, are Bridget Gurton, Executive Director of the Danbury Museum and Historical Society, two people who met Marian Anderson, Sam Hyman, former president of the NAACP and a longtime member of the Connecticut Human Rights and Opportunities Commission, and John Cherry, a lifelong Danbury resident and teacher who met her when he was just a child, and Patrick Wild, town historian of Bethel, who tells the amazing story of Marian Anderson's secret wedding in Bethel. And now... Danbury's international celebrity who conquered racism, Marian Anderson. Marian Anderson is considered perhaps the most famous black female operatic singer of the 20th century and maybe even ever. She was certainly one of the greatest contraltos to ever step foot on an opera stage and she sang in the range of sopranos all the time quite well. Her rise to fame, however, really unmasks the worst of America during the Jim Crow era, which was really 1877 to 1964, when segregation was actually legal in the country. Well, she used a combination of grace and her deep-seated religious convictions to overcome all of those racial hurdles and show the rest of us how to use dignity to overcome racism. Marian Anderson was born back in 1897 in Philadelphia. Her dad had to sell ice to support his wife and three daughters. Her mom cared for children in their home because she had been barred from being a teacher because she was black. Well, Marian and those around her knew from an early age that she had that special singing talent, and she dreamed of maybe one day singing at the New York Metropolitan Opera House. It would be the crown jewel for any such performer, but no black had ever done that. Danbury Museum and Historical Society Executive Director Bridget Gurton says Marian Anderson had a lot of support from her community in South Philadelphia where she was born. And ultimately, that evolved into her storied career, not only as a famous performer, but as an inspiration in the civil rights movement. Her church embraced her. Um, when they say rising tide lifts all ships. And so her tide was full of the people from her childhood, uh, the people who came to her early concerts and who showed up at the small venues and then went on to buy the records and say, I knew her when. Well, and I think you can look at, for instance, somebody like Martin Luther King, who used his voice and his oratory skills. And then you look at Marian Anderson, who used her voice in a completely different way. And yet they both had an incredible impact. Absolutely. The fact that we're still talking about Marion's impact, uh, I think, is, is a credit to, uh, to her. Marion's church raised enough money to send her to a prestigious singing academy in Philadelphia, but when she got there to register, they barred her because she was black. But she was undaunted. She entered a contest where the winner would sing with the New York Philharmonic Orchestra, and she won, and she sang with them, and then she got an agent, and then she got her first concert at Carnegie Hall. Well, eventually she was touring nationally and selling records galore, and that actually also made her quite wealthy. Many times, though, her audiences were all white when she went to these venues. The owner would say that if you wanted to sing to black people, you'd have to sing first to the whites and then have a second performance for the blacks. And oftentimes when she got into these cities, she couldn't even stay in the hotel because she was black and she had to go to a different facility that would cater to black people. Well, Marian Anderson inadvertently got thrust into this role of standing up for civil rights, but Bridget says she did it her way. Where she chose to give concerts, encouraging uh, audiences that were not separated or segregated in any way. Uh, you might not have heard her give a, a, a fiery uh, speech you know, at a podium about civil rights, but uh, she was consistently working quietly, 
um, as a civil rights advocate uh, through the majority of her career. One early step was something that was called vertical integration. If you think of an auditorium with the audience there, split a line down the middle and on the left would be the whites and on the right would be the blacks. And while that certainly was imperfect, it was better than having to have two separate performances. Well, finally, on her tour, she got to Chicago, and after the performance, two wealthy patrons approached her and said, you're so good, we want to finance special training for you with a world-renowned specialist in Berlin, Germany. She said, okay, she took her and her agent and went to Germany to do this training, and along the way, she toured all the major opera houses of Europe, which didn't have the same problem as the U.S., because Slavery hadn't been an issue in Europe, and so it was just not a big deal. She did that through a good portion of the 1930s, and when her agent saw that things were maybe changing just a little bit in the United States, he said, let's go back and we'll tour there. Well, it turns out that segregation still had a strong foothold in the U.S., and in fact, there's a famous story about when she got to Princeton, New Jersey, she was booked at a very prestigious place, but she couldn't get a hotel room. So a local resident heard about this and said, here, you come stay at my house and we'll take care of it that way. And that resident was Albert Einstein. Well, in 1939, her popularity at this point now was soaring and her agent said, it's time to book you at Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. Very prestigious address. Unfortunately, it was owned by the all-white Daughters of the American Revolution and they refused to book her. Well, there was a prominent member of the DAR who heard about this and said, enough's enough. Her name was Eleanor Roosevelt, and yes, she was the first lady of the United States. She promptly canceled her membership in the DAR, causing more than a thousand other DAR members to do the same thing. Then she went to her husband, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was in the White House, and said, we're going to make arrangements for Marion to sing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Well, that concert proved to be the seminal moment in Marian Anderson's career, and if people hadn't heard about her until then, they certainly did after that. The date was Easter Sunday, 1939. 75,000 people crowded around the reflecting pool in front of the Lincoln Memorial. NBC Radio broadcast her appearance nationwide for millions more to hear. Patrick Wilde is the town historian in Bethel, Connecticut, and he's made Marian Anderson a focal point of his research over the years. And you'll hear more why in just a second about the secret wedding that was held in that town. But he says that not only was her mere appearance under those circumstances a major civil rights era moment, but he says that she made it even more poignant when she sang the song, the first one at the concert, My Country Tis of Thee. He says she altered the words of a key line. She sang the first lines, but she did not say, of thee I sing. She changed the words to, to thee we sing, because she didn't want her performance in 1939 to be about her. Basically, she wanted it to be about we, the people, this struggle for liberty, this struggle for equality. This is not about me. Well, it was right after this rather earth-shattering performance that Marian Anderson and her longtime boyfriend, Orpheus King Fisher, decided that they wanted to buy a farm that they could call their own, settle down, and a place where they could just be themselves. Here's Bridget Gurton. They knew they wanted to get married. They also knew they wanted uh, a property that was bucolic, for lack of a better term. She spent so much of her life on the public stage that she needed in her downtime, a space that was very opposite of that. And uh, when they were looking for houses uh, in Westchester and and surrounding areas, the color of Marion's skin was a deterrent in the purchase of a home, which is, it's so hard to say those words, you know, to to say that out loud, that's uh, horrifying. Sam Hyman moved to Danbury in the early 1960s. 
During his career, Sam was active in the Danbury chapter of the NAACP, eventually rising up to the rank of president. He was also a longtime official with the Connecticut Human Rights and Opportunities Commission. Sam says that when Marion Anderson and Orpheus King Fisher bought their house in Danbury on Joe's Hill Road, a windy, secluded road on the city's west side, not far from the New York border, they faced prejudice. The property owners were saying, well, the property wouldn't have the same value, you know, with the, if it were to be sold or rented to black people. So they had to buy the adjacent properties. You know, that's still very offensive to, to me. I... I'm very moved by that offense. And as horrible as that story is, I understand it was even worse in some of the other locales that they tried to settle in before Connecticut. Well, we're in Connecticut, though. Not not in Connecticut. I mean, that's just outside of New York. (laughs) And I don't think they expected that either. It didn't matter what your earning capacity was, your ability to buy or sell. You were limited to those sections that blacks could live and blacks could not live. At the time, Marion Anderson was believed to be the wealthiest black female in the United States, and over the next two decades, she'd be called upon by President Eisenhower to represent the U.S. globally as a global ambassador through the United Nations, and both Eisenhower and Kennedy had her sing at their inaugurations. But there's another unfortunate wrinkle to this home purchase story. Orpheus, who was black, came from interracial parentage. He was very light-complected, a human being. He was able to move in and out of circles that uh, other black people were not able to do. So he was mistaken for being white on many occasions. And as the story goes, Orpheus managed the negotiations on behalf of the couple and it managed to bring a deal for the 50-acre farm to close him. But then the owners learned that his partner was Marion Anderson and the terms and the conditions changed to require that additional 50-acre buffer. Well, Marian Anderson was still touring at this point and on the road quite a bit, but nevertheless, Bridget said that she wanted to make Danbury her home. She called Danbury home for almost 50 years. She shopped at Liggett Drug, <laughs> and she, you know, got uh, was lucky enough to receive yellow roses uh, from an admirer every two weeks uh, from Driscoll Flores, and she went to church with us, and she went to Knights of Columbus picnics, and She walked on Danbury's Main Street, and she shopped downtown. There seemed to be something about Danbury's unique diversity that kind of appealed to her. Because we had this massive hatting industry, people from all over the world since 1851 had been settling in Danbury. So we have this very small city where we speak multiple languages, where we've seen um, an increase in uh, racial diversity um, from the post-Civil War period on. So Danbury is multicolored. Danbury is multilingual. Danbury has music, and we have the influence of Charles Ives, and we have this great Danbury Fair, and we have the space for she and, and King to have uh, the modest type farmhouse that they were looking for with lots of property around to explore. I heard that she would occasionally hold events at her house for like up to 200 people. Marion was well known for her ability to uh, host a a gala, a a fun time, a good escape. Now, I would imagine at the time she's here, she's also still so active, not just not so much in touring, you know, for her singing as much as being a a special ambassador for the United Nations and for the United States around the world. So, I mean, she was known for this as well. Yes. Uh, So Marion was always active. You know, as you said, she's traveling around the world, um, but she made time to sing at Danbury High School graduations. Well, Marion Anderson and Orpheus King Fisher moved to Danbury in 1940. It was just a year after that famed Lincoln Memorial concert. He was a famous architect and engineer and was doing quite well. In fact, the story between them is that they met in South Philadelphia, where they were both born and raised and went to school and, in fact, had dated. But as her career was certainly going to be taking off, he stepped aside. She went her way. He went his. He got married, had a child, divorced his wife, and now they were back together again. And They wanted to get married, but they wanted to do it very quietly. No fanfare, no media attention. Here's Betheltown historian Patrick Wild. I think that they basically asked around and said, is there any minister in the area who doesn't know us, but yet is dependable enough to 
keep our secret when we tell him that we want to get married, but we don't want uh, the public and the press to know about it. So they end up at the United Methodist Church in Bethel, and fill in that part of the story. Well, they had stipulated that they did not want to be married in the church itself. They wanted to be married in the parsonage, which was right next door. Now, this was an old Victorian building that had been built in 1894, and by 1943, it was pretty run down. When the minister agreed to marry them, his wife almost uh, had a heart attack because she said this is no place for anyone to be married. But she began this campaign to do as much as she could to put the house in proper order in a short span of two weeks. So paint, wallpaper, curtains, drapes, cornices, slip covers, floral arrangements. She even braided a small oval rug for the couple to stand on as they pledged their vows to one another. And the poor woman was trying to do this in secret. She was trying to do it during wartime rationing, and she was three months pregnant. So this is wonderful that she's made this beautiful place where they can get married, and then something happens. On the day that was scheduled for the ceremony, they received a phone call. It's Marian Anderson saying, we just drove by the church, and there was some huge event <laughs> with a large crowd out on the front lawn. Uh, what's going on? They had been so intent on refurbishing the parsonage that they forgot to check the calendar of events for the church itself. And the women of the Methodist church had scheduled a bake sale on the front lawn of the church. Obviously, they needed a plan B, so the minister came up with the idea of this quaint little out-of-the-way chapel about two miles outside of town called the Elmwood Chapel. Only problem was, was he had to drive seven miles the other direction to get the key, then drive back, and they wanted to do a quick spruce up. We're going to have to sweep, we're going to have to dust, we're going to have to throw out uh, the dead flowers, and then uh, it will be ready. So everybody said, well, this is this is the best plan B we can come up with. The minister obtained the key. They went out to the uh, chapel, did a whirlwind cleaning. Then the reverend said, hey, I've got to go back. I've got to get my uh, materials. I've got to get my vestments. I have to uh, uh, make a quick change and then come back here to the Dodging Town Church. Now they find out that there's a neighbor right near the church who would be the last person in the world that they'd want to have see this thing. That is correct. There was a woman who lived across from the church, and she happened to be the Bethel reporter for the Bridgeport Post. She was very good at sniffing out news. And they said, well, if Marian Anderson is getting married directly across the street from her home, she's going to find out about it. And the minister and his wife said, well, here's what we're going to do. I will go to the church and perform the ceremony. However, you, my wife, eight minutes after I leave home, I want you to call the reporter and keep her on the phone for as long as you can, because she only has one phone, and it's located in the kitchen at the back of the house. And if she's there... There's no possible way she can look out the front window and see what's going on across the street. Well, it turns out the plan B came off without a hitch. She kept the woman talking for 40 minutes straight until her husband returned from the ceremony. So this was kept secret by the people involved, which to me is just amazing. For how long? It was kept secret from just about everybody, except uh, immediate family, uh, into the following November. At that point in time, Marian Anderson's sister, she was told, okay, if you want to leak the news to the press or announce it to the press, you now have permission. Once that news broke, the press called the minister. He had no comment, so they went to the town clerk of Bethel. A smart move. And reluctantly, he had to say, yes, in fact, they did receive a license to get married, so the story was confirmed. 
Well, despite all this happy turn of events for Marian Anderson, she found herself, unfortunately, still on the short end of the racial balance beam many times. One time in the 1940s during World War II, she was going to a concert in Birmingham, Alabama on a train. And on the train were German prisoners of war that were being uh, transported to a holding facility. And they were able to eat in the dining car and Marian Anderson wasn't. And this despite the fact that Marian Anderson had given concerts to soldiers during World War II to beef up their spirits. Well, Marian Anderson's charitable giving while in Danbury extended to many groups, including the local NAACP. Now, Sam Hyman, as we said, was active in that group when he first came to Danbury, and in the early 1960s, he then met a fellow activist at the NAACP, Orpheus King Fisher. Sam says that Marion herself didn't attend meetings at the NAACP chapter like Orpheus did, but she would host fundraisers with top names from the entertainment field in order to raise money for the civil rights cause. There would be people from the world that she was in, the entertainment and the, the opera business, they would be at that. So you would see and meet some very, very important people there. But these were just, just the common people. You know, her behavior was never as such that I'm Marian Anderson. Her behavior was that I'm Sam, how you doing, how's your wife? You know, da da da. Those were the conversations. She was never above other people. Twenty five years after her seminal performance at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, DC, Marian Anderson in nineteen sixty three found herself called back there. This time it was for Martin Luther King Jr.'s March on Washington, the Civil Rights March. She was asked to open the event by singing the national anthem. Here's Bethotown historian Patrick Wilde. Her taxi was caught in traffic, and they're all waiting for her to start the event, and it's a very tight schedule, and eventually they said, well, we're going to have to start without her. Now, Marian Anderson missed being there on time by just minutes. In fact, they talk about her running up the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in tears, sobbing because she had arrived too late. Later in the program, they felt so bad about her missing her performance, and she felt so badly that they asked her to perform a different song, and she sang, He's Got the Whole World, in his hands. And in an interesting footnote to history, Patrick says that Dr. King changed his speech as well to include the same altered wording of To Thee We Sing that Marian Anderson had put in her speech a quarter of a century earlier. Well, Sam Hyman has plenty of thoughts on how Marian Anderson factored into the civil rights movement. Would you speak from your perspective? of the importance of Marian Anderson to the civil rights movement vis-a-vis -vis somebody like Martin Luther King Jr.? I'm not sure if she would describe herself as an activist. I would think not. She did what was right, and it happens to be that it turned out the voice that she had did speak for, you know, uh, civil rights and, and fairness. Uh, but I'm not sure if that was her intentions at all. I think that she just want to perform. She was entitled to that and that the people had the right to enjoy the artistry that she provided. Uh, you know, other people have said, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., of course, had the great oratory skills and she had the great singing skills and in her just overall demeanor and dignity maybe moved the needle in ways that couldn't have been moved other ways. And I think that's a good description of the Martin Luther King, whose role was quite different you know, than hers. And I think that he uh, assumed the, the, the role of leadership. I'm not sure that she ever, you know, embraced that. John Cherry knew Marian Anderson in a way that's unique from any of the others we've talked about so far. John is a lifelong resident of Danbury. In fact, he was an elementary school teacher for nearly 40 years. Back when he was just a youngster, he lived on a street where Marian Anderson and her realtor husband, Orpheus Kingfisher, owned some property. And he remembers that they would swing by from time to time to check out that property. We knew she was important. You, you could just tell. And Fisher, her husband, used to be around all the time. So we were familiar with him. They brought a piece of property on the street where we lived. 
I guess, income property, and she would come and use the phone on occasion. You know, in those days, they, people didn't have cell phones. You had those big black rotary phones. And she would come in and ask my mother if she could use the phone. And every time she'd go in, I'd go running in after her because, like I said, I was a nosy child. Um, but we came in one day, and she had, um, it was during the summer, and we were dirty and sloppy and sweaty and plopped ourselves right in front of this woman. And my mother was giving us the nod to get out of there. We wouldn't move. And this woman graciously sat there and talked to us, these kids, for 30 minutes about her travels in the Far East, just like she was talking to her children. <laughs> it was unbelievable. You know, this is a story I keep hearing about Marian Anderson over and over again, is just how sort of down-to-earth and normal, I guess would be a word that you would use, that she was when in her interactions. Her behavior was normal, but in her presence, you knew you were in the presence of greatness. And I know that sounds stupid, but you could look at her. Her eyes were penetrating. You just knew you were in greatness. She just commanded that kind of attention, even though she was just very down to earth. Do you remember any of the sort of specifics of what she told you about her travels? I mean, what sticks with you about the, her adventures in the Far East? She talked about the, the rituals concerning death and how people had to, they had to watch the grave for so many days because, because of cannibalism. And she was just amazed at what she saw. And she just explained those things to us, you know, what, what the country was like, what the food was like. Wow, that's amazing. How many times did she come over and use the phone? It would be periodically, and sometimes they'd come through the neighborhood and look at the house. He was always in the, around town, and we knew who he was. I know one time I saw her um, in the movies at the Palace Theater. I saw her come in, and people, you could tell, the minute she came in, you could see people's heads turning. Um, but she would never go in when the lights were up. She'd wait until they turned the lights down, and then she'd sneak in and sit. Yeah, she was famous, and she had celebrity status and wealth, but John says she really just wanted to fit in like a regular person. She was extremely fond of my sister, my older sister. I actually sent her records from France to help her with French in high school, and years later, she actually came to my sister's wedding. Holy mackerel, that's, uh, so you, you, you saw her at the wedding? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. As she was coming in, the bridal party was coming in, and she ducked back into the hall and went into the corner until, they, until the wedding party was seated, and then she came in. That's incredible how she went out of her way to make sure she didn't draw attention away. Absolutely. She just wanted to be Mrs. Fisher. And there's still a story to be told. In fact, Marian Anderson's perhaps crowning achievement moment. You recall as a child she dreamt about singing at the Metropolitan Opera House in New York City. Well, at the age of 58, she's at a party. She's at the twilight of her career. And a manager at the Met approached her, tapped her on the shoulder and said, how would you like to come and sing at the Met? Now, she's almost 58. She's at the end of her career, really. Her singing voice isn't what it used to be. But she took on the challenge knowing that to be the first black to step foot on that stage would be an important role to play. So in 1955, she wowed everybody with yet another standout performance. And as Marian Anderson started to grow old at Mariana Farm, that was the name she gave her 100-acre estate in Danbury, her husband, Orpheus, passed away. And while she was still making a few diplomatic trips on behalf of the U.S. from time to time, Bridget Gurton says her schedule had a lot more open time. I think retirement might have been very difficult for her because she was such an active person. And so she worked with her secretary to go through the Danbury News Times each week and see who was interesting. And she invited them up for lunch. <laughs> and she'd just have a casual lunch and say, ah, I just wanted to know you. I wanted to know the community better through you. And Bridget says that Marion made lots of decisions about her personal effects, but she didn't deal with everything prior to her death. Toward the end, as you know, she's her health is, is slipping, her husband's passed away, and and some preservationists get involved, and including the Danbury Museum, saying, uh, gee, you know, isn't there something we can preserve here? And in fact, you did uh, with the museum. Tell, tell me that story. Uh, Marion and King had pre-sold the property as they got older, uh, and they wanted to make sure that their assets were distributed the way they wanted them to be distributed. She, They had made a decision to sell Mariana Farm to a, a developer. Uh, she also made other decisions, uh, like where to send all of her wonderful ephemeral items, her photographs, her letters, her, uh, her bits and bobs. Uh, she was also very humble, and so the idea that somewhere down the line, people were going to care more about the spaces she inhabited uh, didn't really occur to her. 
some people with larger egos might think of, of their personal greatness and, and, and take steps to make sure that the spaces they occupied in life become, uh, you know, the museums that they deserve. That was not her thought process. Well, at Mariana Farm, there was her house and there was a music studio that Orpheus had built for her so she would have a place to practice when she wasn't on the road. It was behind the house and near a swimming pond that he had also created. But again, none of this had been accounted for. So the city worked with the developer who owned the land and the buildings, and the deal was made to cut the studio in half, move it to downtown where the Danbury Museum property is located, reassemble it, and open it to the public. The house she lived in has been remodeled, but it still stands. Now, as this podcast goes to publication, a new mural is being painted in downtown Danbury, honoring Marianne Anderson. It'll be visible if you drive from Interstate 84, exit 5, right into downtown Danbury. It's right there on the side of the building. But the side of the building is one thing. Sam Hyman says on top of the building, there are commercial billboards that he finds somewhat distasteful. If the commercials were compatible, you know, with the story that you're telling with Marion Anderson, to me that would be suitable. But if they're selling Toyotas that has absolutely nothing to do with the Marion Anderson, to me that's the problem. Sam would prefer a bronze statue of Marion Anderson, maybe outside City Hall or in the library courtyard dedicated to her legacy. And that legacy, says Bridget Gurton, is one that anybody can aspire to not just those who were focused on the civil rights movement. It is a narrative about struggle and success and, uh, you know, pulling yourself up from a position, using uh, the, the help and accepting the help of your community to get to a position where you can affect change. And who wouldn't be inspired by that? And she never said a word about the difficulty she faced. She just sang with class and dignity and skill. And that was her message, and it carried the day. It did. Uh, I think that um, she did not envision herself as a civil rights activist. She carried herself in a different way, and she chose to act rather than to speak. up this episode of Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's beaten path. On a personal note, my home is located on some of Marian Anderson's former land holdings. It says so right in my deed, the estate of Marian Anderson. And each day as I drive up Joe's Hill Road toward my subdivision, I think of Marian Anderson as I look at her former estate with several of the original buildings still intact and I frankly consider it a privilege that somebody so remarkable graced this land and I get to drive by it each day. A special thanks to my four guests for this special show, Bridget Gurton, Sam Hyman, John Cherry, and Patrick Wilde. If you like this show, please make sure you follow my podcast wherever you get your podcasts. This way you'll be reminded each week when a new episode is published. And tell your friends, share the podcast link with them. Also, I do presentations on topics that I discuss here on Amazing Tales. I do them in person. I do them by Zoom. I'd be happy to discuss an appearance at your group. Just email me at amazingtalesct at gmail.com. Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Be safe and stay healthy. (laughs) 